Think Tech Hawaii. Civil engagement lives here. I'm telling you, this is going to be a very, very interesting show. I'm Jay Fidel. This is Think Tech, and more specifically, this is Community Matters. But in this case, it's the larger communities, the global community. Uh, and we're calling it Enforced Disappearances. You're going to learn in the course of this show what that's all about. Oh, so maybe, what, 90 days ago, there was a uh, program, the Paul Chung Memorial Lecture, which is uh, done by, uh, I guess, uh, Shirley Daniel and the, uh, what's the name of the school? Uh, Scheidler Business School. Part of Scheidler yeah. College uh, Business. They do this memorial lecture off Paul Chung, who was a, a benefactor of the school. Um, and uh, it's always a distinguished visitor. In this case, in this year, uh, it was Taeyun Beck, who is with me today, uh, who is a Korean professor uh, at the UH School of Law, the William S. Richardson School of Law, and who joins us to talk about, I, I think, what might be his favorite subject, uh, enforced disappearances. Thank you very much for inviting me to this show. You're a human rights person, aren't you? Uh, you can call me like that. Yeah, human rights is in my dear subject, and uh, I'm uh, teaching international human rights law at the law school, mm -hmm. and I'm also uh, working human rights issues at the UN Human Rights Council as a member of a working group. How do, you, how do you get to be a person who is dedicated to human rights? I mean, I think we all should be. I feel in my own, my own perception of the world, I am becoming more interested in human rights than I ever was. A lot of our shows here on Think Tech are dedicated to human rights and Amnesty International, that, that sort of thing. Um, so you went to school originally in, uh, in, in South Korea and in, in Seoul. Um, tell us about your training and tell us how you got involved in human rights. Yeah, actually, uh, as you mentioned, I'm from South Korea and I attended my uh, high school and uh, college at the Seoul National University College of Law. And uh, I have been also involved in uh, democracy movement in South Korea, later labor movement as well. And uh, during the democracy movement in South Korea, actually the concept of human rights was not that much popular. They were more uh, focused on uh, the complete achievement of democracy by ending military mm -hmm. uh, dictatorship regimes. However, uh, after the democratization is consolidated, uh, more and more interest in uh, the individual rights and human rights, and also uh, ways to guarantee those fundamental rights through legal system became more and more important issues. Mm -hmm. And to me, uh, in, in, uh, after coming to the United States to study Master of Law pro uh, pro uh, degree and also later doctoral degree program, I uh, came to uh, understand that the nature of human rights, which is not a guaranteed or entitled rights uh, from the beginning, rather it's a result of ongoing uh, movement to uh, protect people from tyranny, violence, or other human rights violating system. Therefore, uh, human rights itself is actually an extension of my old interest uh, that we had had, I had had in Korea, and also it is uh, a language that the whole global community can share together uh, when they, they discuss human dignity, ways to protect human beings uh, from those uh, threats to human dignity. So you've studied it, you've written about it, you've taught in this area, and you have um, participated actively with the United Nations. Can you talk about your experience with the, uh, with the United Nations? Yeah, actually, I had the honor to be invited to uh, consider the position uh, to be a member of UN Human Rights Council Working Group on Enforced or Involuntary Disappearances in 2015, which I uh, uh, accepted to pursue. And uh, after a vigorous uh, process of appointment and selection, I was uh, uh, actually selected to be uh, one of those five members who uh, represent the 194 UN member states. And I'm uh, representing uh, those states from Asian Pacific region. Mm -hmm. So as a member of working group on enforced or involuntary disappearances, uh, we uh, share cases 
of in, uh, enforced disappearances or when a family member or sources submit the case to UN Human Rights Council. And once the case is registered, uh, we start to compile and uh, determine the nature of the disappearances and uh, assist the government and also the victims to locate the fate or whereabouts of the disappeared persons. It sounds like a TV show. It sounds very <laughs> interesting because you actually deal with the relatives of somebody who has disappeared under mysterious, uh, if not um, um, draconian circumstances. Um, so that's very, you, you meet them. Now you go, you go to Europe to uh, participate in these United Nations meetings? Yes. In fact, uh, every uh, law enforcement agencies are there to help people. If your uh, family member or relatives are gone missing, probably we will go to police precinct to look for the, the information that might be available. However, enforced disappearance issue is a serious uh, violation of human rights because it is done uh, either by governmental agencies, officials, or individuals or groups who are under direct or indirect or mm. uh, consent or in uh, the acquiescence of the governmental agencies. So once you are subject to this type of uh, uh, deprivation of liberty, uh, you, your family member, everybody will be in serious uh, kind of threatening circumstances. So uh, sometimes those governments or even the law enforcement agency in their local context may not be helpful at all uh, with the they may various be corrupt. reasons. Exactly. Or may, they may be involved in those wrongdoings. So those family members are actually intimidated, intimidated or even threatened not to pursue. So mm -hmm. in that kind of situation, they come to the UN. And the uh, UN, ex is, uh, especially my working group, is not to investigate or blame uh, those uh, crime only. We try to be humanitarian body to facilitate the communication between those who are suffering, the victims of enforced experiences and their families, and the governmental agency who wants to uh, look for the whereabouts or fates. And so by establishing this channel of communication and continuously facilitating ending this uh, kind of serious human rights violation, we is, are one of the rare uh, UN human rights body that are very relatively well <coughs> received by uh, those governmental uh, body as well. So you're trying to get the person back? Exactly. And in, uh, when we go to Geneva for our session, we have uh, three sessions every year. Uh, during our sessions, we invite uh, the ambassadors of each government uh, that are concerned, and also family members whose f uh, family me uh, loved ones are missing, and also NGOs uh, we, uh, during our sessions. And we try to uh, uh, study the pattern of the disappearances or the specific circumstances of the disappearances, and also the results of the governmental investigation reported to us so mm -hmm. that we can eventually uh, solve the individual case or more broadly uh, end the kind of patterns of human rights violations that are recurring in specific country context. So interesting. Now suppose um, this organization, is, and gov it's governmental, I mean, it's going to be on the final exam. What is an enforced disappearance? Um, and you, you heard uh, the Taven Beck uh, t tell you uh, generally what the um, definition of it was. It's a government agency or uh, some group related to a government agency operating at the, at the interest of the government agency that effectively kidnaps somebody, takes them off the street, and removes them from society and holds them uh, in imprisonment of some kind. Uh, and sometimes that person survives, but that's, that's a small percentage. Most of them are killed. <laughs> uh, in, yeah, so sorry to interrupt you, but if I could uh, add a little bit about the elements of enforced disappearances, we uh, look at three elements as a core part that consists of enforced disappearances. On the one hand, uh, the arrest, detention, or abduction, which is a form of uh, deprivation of liberty, should happen, but it should be by the, uh, either governmental officials or individual or group, uh, uh, organized group uh, that are acting on behalf of the government. Yes. Or 
with the consent, direct or indirect, yes. or at least in the acquiescence of the government. Yes. And furthermore, the third element is that the government uh, refused to disclose the fate or whereabout of the disappeared person. By doing this, they are actually putting the person out of the protection of the law. Mm. So uh, overall, these uh, three elements actually constitute of crime called enforced In that very country. Exactly. And uh, it is also a, a, a crime under international law yes. as well. Yes. Yes. Yeah. And with the Hague, a criminal court would address it? Actually, uh, this is, uh, if it is committed by uh, the governmental agencies in the widespread and systematic manner, it will definitely consist of uh, crimes against humanity. Yes. And if this is uh, conducted under a uh, war situation, uh, again, Geneva Convention and Hague Convention will be uh, uh, bring into, and then this will be also considered as a war crime. Therefore, if crimes against humanity or war crimes are committed, and if the state had uh, ratified the Rome Statute, the state or, and the uh, agencies can be even subject to the jurisdiction of uh -huh. International Criminal Court. Yeah. And uh, without even going to International Criminal Court, if the state had ratified the convention, International Convention on the Enforced Disappearances, they will also subject to the, the review of the Committee on Enforced Disappearances. So therefore, uh, it's all kind of governmental uh, 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 kind of undertaking to end this crime. Sure. Yeah, and uh, uh, surprisingly, many governments actually are trying to end this uh, 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 wrongful pro practice. but. Um, in many situations, uh, the understanding of the nature of this crime is not really uh, uh, fully shared, and, and also the level of the uh, state response to this type of crime is not uh, still widely shared. Mm. So there's a room uh, for the state to take more actions, and also we are trying very hard to also enhance the cooperation level of cooperation with the government yes. through UN facilities, UN fora. Is there a, an agreement among nations, a, a, con, a, a convention of some kind where they sign on and say, uh, we agree with the United Nations position on this, we agree that it is a crime, we, we won't do it, we won't you know, tolerate it. Exactly. You, is there something that is an agreement between nations on that? Yeah, there, uh, there is actually an uh, international convention on uh, enforced disappearances, and this convention is uh, actually a, uh, has jurisdiction of those states who ratified, signed and ratified this treaty. Additionally, my working group is not based upon that convention. This uh, working group has been established in 1980, uh, when, as you may remember, a lot of missing uh, cases had happened in Latin American country under military junta. Mm. And uh, uh, the UN Commission on Human Rights at the time were really concerned about those missing people. And uh, the, the difficulty of uh, treating those issues is because they are not actually abduction or kidnapping. And, and without finding their bodies, it's very hard to punish those uh, perpetrators. And the family members are completely left, uh, you know, uh, without given any type of remedies. So the UN General Assembly eventually adopted a declaration on enforced disappearances in 1992. Before that, uh, the UN established my working group in 1980. And uh, we continuously report back to UN Human Rights Council and UN General Assembly. So my working group's jurisdiction is broader than the committee. All UN member states are actually subject to our review, and the state actually responds to our communications and the request for investigation and information. But the level of cooperation varies, so we are trying very hard to uh, emphasize how serious issue this is and how important the government should take measures yes. to end this. Yeah. Well, we're going to take a short break, uh, Taehyun Beck. Um, but I, I want to say that after we come back, I'd like to sort of get a handle from you on, on where this is now, mm -hmm. how much of it is happening, how much of it is being solved, mm -hmm. how much of it is not. Um, and uh, what, what, you know, 
what the, the future is, mm -hmm. given a very, what do you want to call it, an angry world these days. Yeah. Um, and it sounds like your work is cut out for you. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much for saying that. That's uh, Taehyung Bick. Um, and he is a professor at William H. Richardson School of Law, and his area of greatest interest is enforced disappearances. And when we come back, we'll learn more about that. Aloha, I'm Wendy Lowe, and I'm coming to you every other Tuesday at 2 o'clock, live from Think Tech Hawaii. And on our show, we talk about taking your health back. And what does that mean? It means mind, body, and soul. Anything you can do that makes your body healthier and happier is what we're going to be talking about. Whether it's spiritual health, mental health, fascia health, beautiful smile health, whatever it means, let's take healthy back. Aloha. Aloha, I want to invite all of you to Talk Story with John Wahee every other Monday here at Think Tech Hawaii. And we have special guests like Professor Colin Moore from the University of Hawaii who joins us from time to time to talk about the political happenings in this state. Please join us every other Monday. Aloha. We're back with Taeyun Beck, and he is a professor of law at the William S. Richardson School of Law, and he is specializing and assisting the United Nations in a workforce on enforced disappearances, which is something we all ought to know about. You know, a comment on the discussion so far, it seems to me that the one most threatening thing that can happen to anyone in any society is to dis disappear and not come back and presumably be killed. And so we really need to study this. We have to shine light on it. And that's what Taeyun Beck does. So one thing to catch up on uh, something you said in the b earlier part of the show is, um, you know, sometimes there may be demands for ransom. Okay, now does the work group get involved in when a family comes and says, oh, our relative has disappeared and we think the government has taken our relative. And, and the government then makes a ransom demand are you ever in the business of negotiating ransom? We are not uh, representing the family member in actual uh, resolution of those situations. But we have been documenting a lot of cases in which uh, sometimes ransoms are involved. And uh, to, to discuss the ransom issue, we uh, first uh, uh, should mention those, uh, the responsibility of uh, non-state actors. In fact, uh, sometimes the disappearances are conducted not only by governmental agencies, but also organized gangsters or militia groups, or sometimes in, time, in domestic conflict situation, uh, some quasi-governmental body that is controlling the region. And under the current UN system, those non-state actors are not member of UN. And therefore, according to our mandate, uh, the act committed by them are not directly uh, subject to our uh, kind of mandate. Therefore, we first look at the governmental environment uh, in terms of uh, uh, committing the crime or in, uh, in terms of investigation or uh, the level of uh, acquiescence or the level of governmental uh, efforts to perform the duty to protect of the, the family members. And if the due diligence is not uh, fully met, then we still can raise the issue with the government. We having said that, sometimes non-state actors uh, or uh, those uh, militia groups or uh, government, uh, quasi-governmental body can arrest people under the color of law, law enforcement, and they uh, do not go through proper notification process toward the family members, and they do not detain the person in the regular prison. So uh, when the person is gone missing, uh, those issues actually are very hard for us to determine uh, enforced disappearances. And in some situations, those uh, people who are involved in the abduction pursue personal interest, or sometimes more systematically uh, pursue monetary gains by requiring ransom for looking for investigate, uh, the information or uh, in exchange for even release of mm -hmm. the person. And in some other context, even governmental agencies or secret agencies uh, are using their official uh, facility and their official capacity 
to contact those family members of those disappear, mm. disappeared, and uh, they demand money. And uh, uh, sometimes uh, those ransom uh, are paid, but the person had not been returned. And those uh, uh, situation uh, is not uh, often seen in the country like Sri Lanka, where they had gone through internal conflict. And also in uh, every situation, actually, the family members are desperate, and they would like to do whatever is re sure. requested. Pay ransom. Who, exactly. And pay ransom or pay any kind of a bribery, whatever is requested, they are willing to do that. Yeah, yeah. So a lot of uh, kind of a, uh, problematic practice we see, and uh, those family members are in a, put in a very vulnerable situation. Yeah, spend every last dime trying to recover your relative. Yeah. So uh, I'd, I'd like to just go a step further on the United States. The United mm -hmm. States, does it have a policy? Um, how how uh, cooperative is the United States in terms of um, you know, working with your work group and working to facilitate the return of people who have been disappeared? Uh, United States uh, is a country relatively uh, free from the general practice of enforced disappearance. Except in the case by of the organized government. crime. Yeah. And, and however, we sometimes see situations where enforced disappearances are actually uh, happening when where U U.S. is involved. Like uh, if uh, uh, during the counterterrorism uh, war, if uh, uh, potential suspects of a terrorist are arrested uh, in cooperation uh, between U.S. Secret security agency and uh, local governmental uh, agencies. And if the person is uh, handed over to uh, the possession of the U.S., or at least uh, if uh, with the U.S. involvement continuing, if the person is missing, uh, we uh, register the case. Uh, either under U.S. or either the country while uh, sending the case also to the United States as well. And uh, uh, in, uh, in terms of the treatment of uh, those uh, prisoners of war or uh, uh, the combatants of a uh, um, militia group or al-Qaeda or other terrorist groups, uh, there are many cases actually uh, that uh, are related to enforced disappearances, and uh, we are requesting U.S. government's uh, uh, assistance to that. And U.S. government is responding to us, but oh. uh, there are still okay. Cases. They're not yeah. being rogue. <laughs> so uh, one other thing that you mentioned um, is, is Latin America. Latin America, you know, mm -hmm. my. A lot of people in this country won't go to Latin America because of the danger of being kidnapped and mm -hmm. held for ransom. And it's happened in so many countries. Mm -hmm. And now we have Bolsonaro in, in Brazil, mm -hmm. uh, right wing, you know, uh, very right wing. Uh, uh, now he's the president of Brazil. Um, and this it may happen in Brazil too. Mm -hmm. And so you must have an ongoing. Uh, a stream of cases that, that come from Latin America, because look at the, for example, the caravans crossing mm -hmm. Mexico right mm -hmm. now. A lot of them are leaving their homes, uh, you know, in, in Latin America, in uh, uh, Central America, mm -hmm. uh, to, to avoid this very kind of uh, inhuman treatment of people. Mm -hmm. um, so uh, I, I guess my question is, you must have a lot of cases coming sure. from that area. Historically, Latin American countries uh, have a lot of uh, enforced disappearances cases, and they are still in our uh, system, uh, many of uh, which unfortunately are not resolved yet. However, it's, new cases are also continuously being reported because uh, the, uh, many of Latin American countries have uh, uh, some internal, uh, sometimes insurgent group or even organized gangster group. And uh, uh, if, uh, even if the initial uh, abduction or detention has been happened by non-state actor, uh, we often see there are governmental environment of uh, police officials uh, assisting or lack of a proper investigation. So uh, many people who are still uh, subject to uh, disappear uh, disappearances are reporting the case to us, and we continuously work with the government of uh, uh, Latin 
can, uh, region like uh, Mexico and Argentina and Chile. And we have a, a list of countries uh, in, on, on a, uh, during our meeting. We, uh, however, uh, are very glad to see at least the many Latin American co countries these days are trying to uh, end this practice, uh, taking proactive role by ratifying the, the Convention Against the Enforced Disabilities, and also uh, even legislating domestically the crime of enforced disabilities. Mm. Mm. In many countries, there is no crime of enforced disabilities. They think abduction, kidnapping is enough. But <laughs> abduction, kidnapping is different type of crime than enforced disabilities. Sure. And this crime is actually continuing crime unless it is resolved. So to have uh, the provision of uh, enforced disappearance crime in criminal law make huge differences. Mm. So uh, what I can say to you is that, yes, problems are continuing, especially with those uh, migration stream, stream going on. There are also many people who are going missing during their uh, kind of pro process of migration, especially if they are uh, defrauded by uh, the, the trafficking uh, agencies, or uh, if there is any agency who just uh, run away after they are caught in the borderline, and the border guards, if they just kick them out without giving water or any proper equipment while there are deserts. P yeah. People can die because of those actions. And so sure. even at this time, we see a flow of uh, new problems. And in Libya, as we have seen, child who are trying to enter into another country's border, sometimes are not accepted, and they drown in the ocean, right? Yeah. So it's very hard to locate the responsibility. Who is responsible for that specific Well, case? let me go a step further on the, yeah. ch on the child. Mm -hmm. Now, we've seen this year, 2018, we've seen the Trump administration and the Immigration Service <coughs> separating parents and children mm -hmm. of those mm -hmm. who would seek asylum in this country, mm -hmm. and they physically separate them and don't keep a database, in my opinion, they don't have a database mm -hmm. about the, the parent who's being held here or returned to his or her country and the child who's somewhere in a, in a child facility, but we don't know where. And as far as those parents are concerned, that's a disappearance. Exactly. Exactly. It's an enforced disappearance. Yeah. So um, enforced disappearance can happen uh, because of uh, migration, or sometimes the migration can happen because of enforced dis disappearances in some context. Yeah. And uh, those child, for example, uh, should be treated uh, with a special kind of uh, attention yeah. because the, the, those child are really susceptible to any type of human rights violation. Yeah. And uh, uh, if we do not fully uh, kind of you know, give a uh, proper measure, they can be easily a victim of uh, enforcement. Is the United cases. Nations involved in this issue? Has it made a statement? Has your working group got involved in these missing, there are several hundred of them at least, uh, children who have effectively been disappeared, nobody can find them, nobody knows mm -hmm. where they are, and yet somehow they are in the custody of the United States government right at the very top. Mm -hmm. um, what, 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 what is the United Nations doing about that? What are you doing about it? What can we do about it? Yeah, first of all, uh, in terms of our mandate, we have uh, two different types of activities. On the one hand, we first uh, register cases and determine whether the case is enforced disappearances or not uh, through either uh, urgent procedure or standard procedure. So for us to initiate our uh, environment, there should be a case uh, registered reported to our working group in Geneva. Uh, our secretariat is actually uh, working uh, to receive all of the information and these complaints. And once it is registered, then it becomes a part of our system, and we start mm. to communicate mm. with the government, mm. requesting uh, the information of the whereabouts of the person. Do you have any cases like that now? Uh, I cannot discuss a specific case uh, because of our conf confidential nature of our mandate. Uh, but uh, I, I, I think we are still receiving many cases, and in, in the United States, uh, if— uh, uh, Well, if they want to make a complaint to, to the working group or mm -hmm. the United Nations, or, you know, to, to the human rights part of the United mm -hmm. Nations, where, where would they go? What would they do? Who would they write to? What website would they look at? Can you give us some help? Some of them may be yeah. watching right now. Sure, you know? sure. Actually, UN Human Rights Council has a—, a uh, a website called OHCHR.org. 
And this website is actually leading toward many of human rights agencies. Uh, and also it has a link to a general complaint uh, uh, that you can use to submit specific situation. And if uh, it is directly related to enforced disappearances, uh, the working group on enforced or involuntary disappearances are also link is there. And if you go to the website, uh, there is a form which is very easy to fill out. And if you fill out the complainment form with uh, uh, the identity of the missing person and the situation and the efforts that they had made, made so far to locate the person, then our secretariat in, uh, located in Geneva uh, will compile it and send it to our working group so that we can start to review. Very and if important. it's an urgent procedure, we responded within uh, sometimes a week. Like, uh, the, the recent Saudi Arabian journalist uh, initial yes uh, disappearance. It was reported to us the next day, and we issued uh, urgent uh, appeal a week later, demanding the government to start to look for the information. And of course, it is led to uh, the tragic murder, uh, premeditated murder. We are thinking. Uh, but uh, again, if it's an urgent issue, we res try to respond urgently. And if, if it is a normal case that had happened more than longer than three months ago, we go through our regular session and we follow up on that. Yeah. Additionally, we can also do country visit to uh, study the pattern of enforced disappearances and also report it back mm -hmm. to UN Human Rights Council, eventually to UN General Assembly. This is, this is really important. So you're involved in that, and you would be involved in that, of course. Uh, one point I'd like to cover before we mm -hmm. before we end, um, mm -hmm. I, I tell you and Beck, is um, you know what wh what is the scope of this? You know, recently a movie was made by uh, uh, um, it was called Human Flow, uh, and it was uh, made by a Chinese um, a Chinese uh, artist by the name of um, I'm, I'm going to come up with his name in a minute, mm -hmm. <clears throat> uh, Ai Weiwei. Ai Weiwei, yes. Yeah. And he, he he'd find uh, the human flow that we're, we're in camps right now mm -hmm. in this world, in the mm -hmm. global mm -hmm. count of them. There were 65 million people in these camps. Um, and as you said, a lot of them are either coming or going has mm -hmm. disappeared. Um, but um, uh, the numbers, the numbers for enforced disappearances, what do we have? You mentioned that there were 57,000 in total reported forced disappearances that say, you, you have seen, your work group has seen. Then of the 57,000, how many are unsolved? How many do you believe resulted in a murder? Uh, last year, we have received 800, a little bit more than 800 cases. Around 400 cases we have uh, clarified. And out of those 400 cases, unfortunately, many of them uh, were uh, found dead. And um, uh, a good number of people were found alive in prison. So sometimes in, in some countries. Yes. So exactly. nobody knows yeah. that they are in prison. Or in some country, uh, they are kept without actually properly notifying yeah. uh, their family members. Yeah. Uh, so it depends on country context. Yeah. So, and um, uh, still, there are so many people gone missing without the proper information provided. And the, the ongoing pro flow of uh, hum uh, the enforced disappearances is also very alarming. As you mentioned, in China these days, uh, Xinjiang Uyghur people are being re-educated by the government. But uh, from the family point of view, they are uh, displaced from one person to unknown places, and they are detained without proper notification. So it's a kind of a virtually incommunicado detention. And uh, the, the, the numbers that is currently being cited are huge. So yeah, it, it, it's a very unfortunate, but in many countries in the world so far, 102 countries uh, uh, had been registered, 108 states had been registered so far in our system, and still 92 states have uh, ongoing enforced disappearance problems and new cases are coming in. So we should end this as soon as possible with a, a really cooperation between government, civil society, and also family members. And it's, a, it's end increasing, it. isn't it? The phenomenon um, of enforced disappearances is yeah, increasing. Especially in some area like Asia and some area where con conflicts are going on, the increase is really, really rapid. So we are really worried. Mm. Your work is cut out for you. Thank you for doing your work.
Thank you very much you're for helping, yeah, allowing me to talk about this. Tai Yun Beck, Thank William you. H. Richardson School of Law, Professor of Human Rights. Thank, Thank you so you. much. Mm -hmm.